On Easter Sunday, 2020, one of the most prolific tornado outbreaks ever recorded would devastate the southeastern United States, producing tornadoes that left a swath of damage from Texas all the way to Maryland. Several of these tornadoes would shatter records and leave everything in their path unrecognizable. This is their story. The month of April is no stranger to severe weather, especially in the southeastern United States. However, conditions in the weeks leading up to April of 2020 would foster an environment capable of unleashing massive devastation. Our story begins over the northern Gulf of Mexico. For weeks, a ridge of high pressure has been cooking the southeast, drastically increasing surface temperatures and creating an unseasonably moist and unstable air mass, ready to rise into powerful thunderstorms. Meanwhile, an upper-level low over the southwestern U.S. is evolving into a negatively tilted shortwave trough. As the trough approaches the southeast, it begins drawing in moist, unstable air northward in the presence of a powerful low-level jet. These ingredients are coming together to create an unstable and highly sheared environment favorable for the formation of intense supercells and tornadoes. The stage is set for a major tornado outbreak. The outbreak would begin in central Texas as the storm system began to move eastward, spawning several brief, weak tornadoes before transitioning to a more linear mode. The squall line then progressed through northern Louisiana, spawning several embedded tornadoes which gradually increased in intensity as the storms tapped into more unstable air. Two of these tornadoes would strike near Monroe, Louisiana, producing EF3 damage before moving on to the east. As the storms moved on to the east, a warm front lifting north would significantly destabilize the atmosphere over Mississippi and Alabama, creating an area of both intense wind shear and strong instability, prompting the Storm Prediction Center to issue a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch for the area, anticipating several strong tornadoes. The atmosphere would not disappoint. By 3.30 p.m., a pair of isolated supercells had developed ahead of the main squall line and at 3.39 p.m., the lead supercell would produce its first tornado. The tornado began near Jefferson Road and traveled northeast towards the small community of Hope, Mississippi. The twister quickly intensified, reaching EF2 strength as it damaged several homes and trees near Hope. The tornado maintained its intensity as it continued to grow in size before abruptly becoming violent as it completely swept away a well-built home, leaving little debris remaining and bending the anchor bolts that secured the home to its foundation. The twister continued on at EF3 intensity for some time, severely damaging thousands of trees and a few homes as it made its way through a mostly rural area. The tornado then began to slowly weaken before dissipating southwest of Bassfield. The tornado was on the ground for 21 miles and sadly killed four people, earning an EF4 rating with estimated peak winds of 170 miles per hour. The parent supercell began to cycle as it continued to the northeast, and at 4.12 p.m., the mesocyclone once again found its way to the ground below. The tornado formed along Bassfield Cemetery Road, inflicting minor tree damage as it neared the outskirts of Bassfield. The tornado began to intensify as it narrowly missed the town just to its southeast, strengthening first to EF2 strength and then EF3 strength as it uprooted trees and swept away a manufactured home. The tornado then became violent as its winds reached EF4 intensity, debarking trees and leaving only the stubs of the largest branches remaining. The now violent wedge tornado began to rapidly expand and within only a few minutes of its formation was already a mile wide. As the tornado continued onto the northeast, it reached its peak intensity as it obliterated a large well-built cabin. The cabin was anchor bolted to its foundation and was completely swept away down to the concrete slab. However, damaged surveyors noted some structural defects that led them to apply a high-end EF4 rating. Nearby, a truck was picked up and lofted 300 yards into a field and left mangled beyond recognition. The twister continued on to the northeast, inflicting extreme EF4 damage to hundreds of trees in its wake, completely stripping them of all bark. EF4 damage continued as the tornado rapidly expanded in width, and as it passed between the towns of Seminary and Collins, reached its peak width of 2.25 miles. The storm leveled millions of trees as entire forests were mowed down by the monster tornado. 
As the storm crossed US-49, several structures sustained severe damage and some were completely swept away. The tornado then crossed into a mostly rural area, continuing to inflict severe tree damage and destroying several mobile homes as it quickly approached the small town of Soso. One of the few known images of the storm would be taken by storm chaser Connor McCrory, showing the enormous wedge tornado passing just to their north as the twister crossed US-84. As the tornado entered Soso, it intensified again as it damaged or destroyed most of the structures on the south side of town, including multiple homes, a church, a convenience store, and a local fire station. After exiting Soso, the twister again entered a more rural area, inflicting widespread EF2 damage to trees and some structures as the tornado neared the small community of Moss. As the tornado entered Moss, it strengthened once again to EF4 intensity as it damaged or destroyed most of the structures in town, with some being reduced to nothing more than piles of rubble. After exiting Moss, the tornado began to gradually weaken as it continued to the northeast, causing EF1 to EF2 damage for the remainder of its life before finally dissipating over the town of Pachuta, sadly taking the lives of eight people. The tornado was on the ground for more than an hour and had traveled for 67 miles and reached a peak width of 2.25 miles, the third widest tornado ever documented. The parent Stormwood cycling quickly produced another brief EF2 tornado that impacted the towns of Stonewall and Enterprise. However, the day was far from over. Following closely behind the first storm, another powerful supercell produced another tornado at 4.36 p.m. This tornado began near the small town of Topeka and roughly paralleled the first two EF4s. It would narrowly miss the towns of Oakvale, Carson, and Collins and did some minor damage to the town of Stringer. However, thankfully, the tornado mostly tracked over a rural area, resulting in no fatalities despite the storm tracking for 84 miles and inflicting EF3 damage, making this the longest tracked tornado of the outbreak. After the two main supercells were absorbed into the squall line, the storms took on a more linear mode with semi-discrete supercells embedded within. These embedded supercells would continue to produce a swath of mostly weaker, short-lived tornadoes as the squall line raced to the east. However, a few of these would be quite strong including an EF-2 that impacted Chatsworth, Georgia, killing eight, and two EF-3s, one of which would impact the southeastern portions of Chattanooga and sadly killed two more. As the 12th moved into the morning hours of the 13th, the parent storm system began to move into the Carolinas. The first significant tornado would touch down at 3.21 a.m. southwest of Seneca, South Carolina. The twister began as an EF-0, inflicting light tree damage before rapidly intensifying as it entered Seneca. This tornado would inflict EF3 damage and claim another life before leaving Seneca. Damage here would exceed $100 million. Further to the south, the same line of embedded supercells would produce another swath of significant tornadoes, including several EF3s. One of these tornadoes would spawn in the Savannah River site, narrowly missing several of the decommissioned nuclear reactors and tritium extraction facilities located on site, before directly impacting the small town of Springfield. Another EF-3 would form south of Elko and track for 37 miles, claiming two more lives, and another would reach EF-4 status as it ripped through the rural communities of Estill and Nixville, striking a federal prison and taking five more lives. Several weaker tornadoes would develop after this cluster had finished its onslaught. However, thankfully for the devastated communities, the outbreak was finally coming to an end. By the time the 2020 Easter tornado outbreak had finished its rampage, 32 people had lost their lives and hundreds more had been injured with damage reaching an unbelievable $3 billion, making it at the time of writing the second deadliest tornado outbreak of the 2020s behind only the December 10th, 2021 tornado outbreak. A total of 141 tornadoes were confirmed with 132 of those occurring in just a 24 hour period. This incredible record is only surpassed by the super outbreaks that occurred on April 3rd, 1974 in April 27, 2011. The strongest tornado of the outbreak would be rated EF4 with estimated peak winds of 190 miles per hour and reached an unbelievable 2.25 miles wide, the third widest tornado behind only the Hallam Nebraska F4 and the 2013 El Reno EF3. However, given how widespread and violent the damage from this tornado was, 
Many might question why this tornado wasn't given a rating of EF5. To help understand why this is the case, I've enlisted the help of my friend and fellow content creator, Ethan Moriarty. Hello everyone, this is Ethan Moriarty with June 1st Severe Weather Research. I'm a mechanical engineer that analyzes tornado damage in order to better understand tornado dynamics and how structures behave in tornadic environments. Of the nearly 150 tornadoes that touched down in the 2020 Easter outbreak, 13 of which earned a rating of EF3, while another three earned the rating of EF4. While the three EF4s were undoubtedly very strong tornadoes, some argued that the Bassfield tornado in particular should have earned a rating of EF5. Let's take a closer look at the damage indicator that resulted in the final classification for the tornado. Looking at the images taken by the National Weather Service survey team, this structure was one of the better built homes in the path. Note the properly installed anchor bolts in the foundation. However, while this appears to be a well-built structure for the southeastern United States, the lack of anything beyond toenailing in terms of structural support for the studs tells me that this structure would have not have survived at the 200 mile per hour threshold needed to classify this tornado as an EF5. In fact, the majority of the homes in the US would never survive a 200 mile per hour wind load. Looking back at the EF5s that have occurred in history, most of which occurred in heavily populated areas where there was an abundance of extremely well-built damage indicators. EF5s that didn't hit heavily populated areas struck an industrial level DI that needed extreme wind loads in order to damage. Even in the EF5s that have occurred throughout history, all of the damage indicators that were actually given a 5 were few and far between. Even though it might be safe to say that the Bassfield tornado is capable of producing EF5 damage, it tracked through rural Mississippi where there wasn't an abundance of high level damage indicators that were capable of verifying the 200 mile per hour threshold needed to verify an EF5.